How long will we live like this? And is there a pathway back to normality? In truth, no one can answer honestly right now. The number of new COVID-19 cases in Australia is slowing, but we're told it's too soon to start relaxing the extreme measures now in place. So how are you coping? How are we coping? Tonight, the complex challenges of this extraordinary moment. Our panel is standing by to talk to you wherever you are, right across the country. You've got the questions. Now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, food writer and author Matt Preston in Melbourne. CEO of the National Mental Health Commission, Christine Morgan. Former Deputy Prime Minister, John Anderson in Tamworth. Former Socceroos captain turned refugee advocate, Craig Foster. As well as broadcaster and comedian, Julie McCrossan in Wellington in New South Wales. Also here to answer some of your questions a little later tonight, author and former teacher, Gabby Stroud. We'll cross to Tasmanian Senator, Jackie Lambie on the extraordinary medical emergency unfolding in northern Tasmania right now. We're also getting some expert answers from our good friend Costa, uh, and these guys are staying up much later than normal. We'll catch up with the Wiggles as well. Remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Quanda is the hashtag. And tonight we're dedicating our social comments on screen to essential workers, so please do feel free to show your gratitude to those that you would like to thank, whether you know them or not. Let's start with our first question tonight from David Phelan in Augustine Heights, Queensland. With Queensland now announcing that kids aren't going to be going back to school for five weeks, Oliver and Georgia here are going to be at home a lot more often. Um, so how, what are we all going to do to stay sane? Or does anybody want to trade these two in for some other ones? <laughs> <laughs> Matt Preston, are you ready to trade in any children yet? Um, I've, I've got three. I'll swap uh, two small ones. I reckon that's the going rate. That's that's five teenagers, I think. Um, yeah. Look, look. It's a, it's a tough question. I've got three kids. Um, they're obviously they go back to they're going back to school, so that'll little take some of the load off. But I think what we're seeing a lot of is is um, is kids getting to the kitchen and cooking and learning things like how to bake or all those granny skills that have come back into fashion. Um, it does, and it does mean with some time, now you've got the time to clear up the inevitable mess that goes with having seven and eight-year-old, nine-year-olds cooking in your kitchen. Uh, Julie McCrossan, you grew up with five other siblings, I think sharing bedrooms for a lot of that time. Are you surprised at the, the angst with which we approach all of this staying at home time right now? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, I think uh, to be crammed into a house with a large number of people and not being able to get out can be incredibly stressful for some families. And are you experiencing this with, with great difficulty or are you enjoying the time? Look, I, I'm at a very fortunate stage of my life where I'm 65, I'm in a happy marriage of uh, 24 years and I've got space in my house and I don't have the economic pressures, you know, my house is paid off. So uh, I fall into that very lucky category of people uh, for whom time for reflection uh, is... Uh, it has some positives to it. And I also have access to technology that enables me to link uh, with support groups and friends through technology. But that's not true in all parts of rural and remote Australia. I think there's going to be increasing pressure on our telecommunications, and that's a big issue for some people. And the two and a half million Australians who don't have access uh, to the internet uh, and many who don't have broadband. Christine Morgan, it's safe yeah. to say that there are many Australians for, this, for whom this moment presents... Great challenge. Look, I think that's true. In fact, I think you, in a way, Hamish, how can we possibly go through all that has been happening, all the uncertainty, the anxiety, the genuine anxiety for so many, and not have it have a bit of an impact on us? I think that would be unreal. So I think that, um, yes, as, as we say, for some of us, it's actually an opportunity where we can take some time out and reflect. For others, there are really significant challenges. OK, yeah. our next question tonight is from Frank Chai in Burwood East, Victoria. I understand and support the need for social distancing. However, when it extends to social isolation, I question whether the government has gone too far. Should not the consequences on mental health and family violence have been considered a lot more and restrictions finessed? 
to mitigate them? Christine Morgan. Great question, great question. That probably goes to the nub of why we say let's ditch social um, isolation and social distancing and call it physical distancing. Just the term. Just mm -hmm. the term. Physical distancing with social connection because it goes right to that point, which is really to say we may need to be, we have to be physically distant from each other. We get that. But let's not lose our connection. G can mm. I That's ask really you to speak specifically to the, to the domestic violence yeah. scenario that clearly exists for many Australians yeah. right now? What, do, what does someone do if they find themselves in that situation and they can't easily go to a shelter? They can't oh, get help? No, they can't. They can't. And it is so... Look, it, we know, Hamish, we know it's always been so hard for so many, usually it's women and children, who are finding themselves in those situations. So we must reach out to them, we must remind them that there is help. I think that's the most important thing. But, but you know but what? what? Is there help right now? Is it only over the phone? It, well, it's in the, all of the domestic violence um, hotlines that are there, all those services. Certainly hotlines, they're all there. Um, any mental health service line will help. And I think the other thing we have to remember is to be there for each other. I think it's behoven on us to kind of keep an extra eye out for something that might be concerning. Uh, I'm sorry to push you on this, but no, is that sure. sufficient? I mean, there are clearly going to be women and children in danger. There are. Essentially in enclosed spaces yeah. for prolonged period of times right now. Is saying call a hotline enough? It's not enough in and of itself. This is why I think, let me turn it around and say the biggest thing we can do is be alert. All of these women, all of these children do live in communities and we can't know always, but you know what, sometimes the antenna are there. We can hear loud voices, we can see concerns. So we have to do what we can to strengthen them and encourage them, make it public, make it part of our conversation, how important it is to reach out. But I call on all Australians, we have to keep out looking for each other to see what is happening behind those closed doors. And if we've got a concern, it's better to reach out and ask than to not. Isn't it difficult to do that, Craig Foster, right now? Because yeah. all of those social interactions have just disappeared. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and keeping these social connections right now and how we do that is, yeah. is part of the national discussion is really important. But also, to your point, um, you know, when it comes to domestic violence, it's one of the issues, I think, and there are many in society right now, that we're seeing amplified uh, through this pandemic, and that is some lack of funding of, of some of these types of services and many of these issues, whether it is with the homeless mm. or whether it is, uh, you know, with the international students that we have uh, currently and their need for uh, support right now, all of these inequities are, are being exposed right now. So it's actually, uh, I think, and also an opportunity for your sector to come forward right now and make this an opportunity to talk about what is necessary, what is needed. I noticed that the DV Connect up in Queensland has has had about five and a half million dollars funding in recent days in the last week. That's so right. much of your sector are calling for more funding we're, we're and so calling on. for more and, and certainly 1800 Respect has had some additional funding. Men's Helpline or men, Men's Line um, has mm. received it. Look, I think, I think we can't say that that's not right. I think it is really important. I think what's happening with DV is that we have pressure cooker situations in homes. Mm -hmm. We have people under more stress than normal. We have, I think, a really critical thing, which is that we, are we have a sense of losing control of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that can be a particular trigger factor. So I think that, yes, you're right, there are exacerbating circumstances. Um, it is always a challenge, let's be honest. It's always a challenge for any woman to reach out for help in those circumstances. Julie McCrossan, what did you make of the news that of all the services and facilities that would remain open, one would be bottle shops. Look, I was deeply disturbed by the fact that bottle shops are being called an essential service because while alcohol is not the only cause of domestic violence, it is often a practical trigger. But could I just say, for women and children in homes right now, we are not going to get a vaccine for this uh, uh, virus for at least 18 months. It could well be longer. We cannot leave uh, women and children alone in homes where perpetrators can think no one can get in here because they're too afraid to come in because they might get the virus. And so access to protective clothing, protective masks, training in how to enter homes safely is as important for the police, uh, the non-government services, the Red Cross, the organisations that are in local communities who may be able to reach in into the private home is absolutely essential. And uh, well, that can, goes, can of I course, to people you, who are... 
Can I ask you, though, bluntly, Julie, is it enough for our government to say there are some hotlines, you can call them? Well, I'm saying, I'm saying no. I don't think children and, and women, and, I'm, and I want to particularly focus on, on children, but obviously women as well, they cannot be considered to be safe we know, unless people can come into the home and give them the opportunity to let people know what's happening. We can't just leave them alone in those houses. The evidence is in pandemics like this, domestic violence increases. We know that. It's extraordinarily stressful for people. And so access to protective gear so police and others can go into homes is absolutely crucial. Look, I think one thing to say that's really important here, Julie, that I agree with, is that we need to do so much more than just rely on the hotlines. They're critical. They're critical because they're 24-7, Hamish, and you never know when you've got the opportunity to reach out. Let's not close them down. But what I think Julie's talking about is that more assertive outreach, and that's what I would fully endorse. But I would call not just on police. Yes, certainly police, certainly others, but we've all got connecting points with these people. We've all got our antenna, and I think that's what we're really calling for from Australians, is to keep an eye out. Because as you say, Julie, people are feeling trapped and we've got to reach out to them. We know that. We know that with so many, so many issues with mental health, you've actually got to reach out to make that connection. All right. Well, if you or anyone you know is experiencing difficulties, you can always contact, as Christine was saying, Lifeline on 1800RESPECT, uh, as well as the other numbers on your screen right now. And Beyond Blue has also just launched a new coronavirus mental health support line and website. You can find that at coronavirus.beyondblue.org.au. Well, the next question is from Deb Rouse in Maribyrnong, Victoria. There's been a lot of advice about managing isolation in a household full of your family members or how to care for elderly relatives. As a single person, though, with no immediate family and friends and without the usual human contact points of cafes, bars, cinemas and so forth, some of us are feeling more isolated than ever. I think we're an invisible cohort who may not, for six months or more, see or touch a single human being who's known to us. We're truly isolated in how we're experiencing this isolation. What advice do you have for us to make sure that we don't end up being forgotten? John Anderson, is there a forgotten cohort in Australia, the single people living alone, as Deb said, who might not be able to hug someone for a very long period of time? Well, the truth is, I think that there are many lonely people in Australia, but they're not necessarily... There are people who live alone who are not lonely. There are people who live with others who are lonely. It is unquestionably a stressful time. There's no doubt about that. We know from the research that the initial fear, which for older people focused on death uh, and illness, uh, for younger people is about their jobs and economic future, that is morphing over time into concern over depression, keeping morale up and so on and so forth. Not without wanting to in any way undermine the importance of the issues that have been raised, the, hor the horror of domestic violence, uh, the spiking of the applications uh, for divorce. Many people find when they're thrown together, they've grown apart. Uh, I would want to say this. We can be thankful for a very great deal. We're a wealthy country where we have unbelievable medical services and courageous people demonstrating what selflessness looks like. Uh, we have room for physical distancing. We have tremendous communications by which we can stay in touch. And I would also want to say this, that particularly those struggling with what to do with the kids, this can be a nightmare which reduces them and limits their capacity to cope with what is going to be a difficult and more challenging uh, world when it ends, uh, which it must one day. Or they can look back on it at a time when they saw adults seeking to take a positive attitude, seeking to intentionally engage with them, draw them out, address their concerns, let them talk the issues through, set up a weekly or a twice weekly dinner time, assign X to do something in terms of getting the meal ready, Y to set a topic for everybody to talk about, make sure that everybody's there. Uh, if you like, try to do what we can to lead our children through this because they will need... Ex young people are going to need great resilience coming out of this. It's going to be a very different world. Uh, Matt Preston, are there people in your life you worry about right now in terms of that isolation? Oh, yeah. 
I, I, I think I think Deb makes a really, 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 really important point. I've had this conversation with a with a couple of, of really good friends who who talk exactly about six months and no no personal touch. And I think, but I think probably the the message that comes out of it is that there seems to be two groups of people. There are those people who who, who will struggle, and there are those people who are th who will who will thrive or they will survive and they'll deal with it. And if if you are feeling that if you are feeling that you are you know that, that you can you if you're if you're if you're coping with it, it's your responsibility to reach out to those people, to talk to them regularly. To you know, I, I ring my mother, who's about 86 years old. I'll ring her now once a week, rather than once every two months. I'll I'll talk to I'll talk to a couple of my single friends, maybe twice, three times a week. Whether I'll zoom them or Skype them or house party them or whatever I do, to, just to kind of maintain some connection there. Because because you're absolutely right. It's a it's a long time to be left alone with your phone and all those messages of um of depression. Well, speaking of devices, Julie, I can see that you're holding up some kind of device. What, what on earth are you doing? I, I'm holding up a picture of my little cavoodle, Bruno, <laughs> and I, I'm not in any way meaning to trivialise at all the question this woman has asked. And I, too, am using Zoom to connect with my uh, the church parish I'm a member of. I'm a member of a self-help group, and we all link up by Zoom. But human touch, touch, yeah. uh, a mammal, a fellow animal, is really important. And uh, uh, this is the time, if you haven't got a pet... I'm a mad dog person, and since cave days, we've clean clung to the dogs. It's time to get a dog or a cat, a mammal, to get in bed with you and be a comfort. And I mean this quite seriously. I, I don't know what uh, Christine thinks, but I, I think there is research that pets are an important source of, um, uh, of uh, loving affection. I also know that Sophie Scott, the ABC TV health reporter, got a picture of her cavoodle onto the news the other night, and I promised I'd do the same for, for Bruno, <laughs> my dog. Uh, <laughs> Fallen victim to some kind of bet here. Uh, but, but there is yeah. research behind uh, that. Look, there's totally research on this, and look, it does actually break my heart, Deb, because I was talking to a colleague of mine who was just making this point just this week that um, she is somebody who finds herself on her own and faces the prospect that for six months she can't give somebody a hug and what that does to, to our mental well-being. So whether it's pets, whether it's something else, yes, let's do that. But I think, again, Matt, you made a great point, which is let's do that extra reaching out. And I think what you talked about that was so powerful there, Matt, is that it's about putting the personal connection into communication. So ditch just communicating with people and actually put yourself into it. Reach out make whatever connection you can. OK. Well, someone who has been calling for even tougher lockdown measures is Senator Jackie Lambie. She's in her home state of Tasmania, where two hospitals, two major hospitals, have in fact closed due to a COVID-19 outbreak. This has got huge implications uh, for that region. Uh, Jackie Lambie is on Skype tonight. Uh, hi, Jackie. Uh, this decision regarding the hospitals is enormous news where you are. A very significant number of people now in quarantine. Yeah, so there was about 1,200 workers from the hospital itself and combined. Both the public and the private hospital are uh, joined together. They're, on the, they're in the same um, area, so that's been a bit of a problem in itself. And then out of that, while they're self-isolating, everybody in the household has to. So we're estimating probably up to about 5,000 people will have to be in full lockdown, which means they can't go out and get scripts, they can't go out to the supermarket. That will have to be um, done for them. Um, for a population that's about 100,000 or just over, that's about 5% of our population. The unfortunate thing is we have... I have watched over the last... especially the last few weeks of businesses, um, they go, they've gone under, they've closed their doors, Hamish. Um, so everything was pretty much quiet out there. Even Katie's and Suzanne's were closed about 10 days, so there wasn't much left open. But I think after the behaviour last week of the going on in Bunnings and going on in Kmart, not self-isolating and things like that, um, it's now come to the crunch and the Premier has no other choice but to put us in full lockdown. So unless you're a central service worker... Um, then guess what? You're staying at home. You have been calling for tougher lockdowns for quite some time. I mean, what do you want now? 
Um, yeah, I think that we're beyond that. We're actually probably in, in, in full lockdown. Look, it's gone way too far down here. Um, I think northwest coasters need to be really realistic about this because even if you're carrying it in your house, it could take about 10 days for one of your children to come come down with it. That could go on for about um, four weeks. The other problem that we have down here is testing. I can tell you now, one of the testing areas that they've put up is at the other hospital, which is about 30 minutes away. That's a public hospital. Um, and we also have one in our own backyard here in Burnie. And apparently they can't have the other one open until the end of the week. So that would tell me that there is not the testing kits down here that need to be down here. And nobody is being honest about that. And they need to come out and be honest. So are you worried that this particular part of the country is not equipped to deal with what's unfolding right now? I mean, that these are probably the most stringent lockdown scenarios anywhere in the country right now. I doubt if there's any rural or regional area across Australia right now that is prepared for this, I'll be honest with you. And so I suppose as someone that lives there, you must personally feel pretty worried. Um, yeah, look, it's been a really long day. I've, I've done a lot of interviews and, you know, you're trying to, trying to keep your head up and trying to keep it um, nice out there and happy and give people hope. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been a long day and I'm sure that we're all feeling it. I went um, for a walk this morning and I can tell you what, I didn't see any cars out. That was at about 9.30 this morning. Um, and people, uh, even up to a week ago, were probably not... Um, using the social distancing, or I can tell you now, it's about 10 metres between us all in the park and whatever else, so it's hit hard and it's hit home here. Um, and then Premier had no other option but to go in hard, go in fast, so we can get out of this as quickly as possible, mate. That's the hope. Um, there was no other plan. There is no plan B, um, unless you want to try herd, hum um, herd immunity, um, which obviously is not working because you've only got to have a look at the hospital. So right now uh, we're down on those healthcare workers and everyone else. And I know that they're trying them, the... Uh, the Defence Force, especially the Army, sending some down, some of its own medical specialists and that down here to try and cover that. We had GPs that were open on Easter Monday today trying to pick up some slack. So everybody's trying to do what they can down here, mate, but it's tough. And I tell you what, it's going to get a lot tougher. Um, and then we're going to have to come out at the other end when it's all over and clean up this economic um, impact that it's going to have on us all. And it, it's already taking out so many small businesses. For them to restart is going to be really, really difficult. It's, it's going to be a very slow process, mate. Senator Lambie, thank you very much for talking to us tonight. John Anderson, if you are in a regional area right now, you must feel pretty vulnerable, mustn't you? Well, look, it's, it's certainly the case that some of the bigger regional areas, I think, are surprisingly well equipped. Uh, my eldest daughter is a doctor and she's on the front line in a major centre, Orange, and the uh, preparations that they've made I think are impressive and amazing in the circumstances. But I'm very conscious that in a smaller centre, I say a Coonabarabran, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, really high level uh, facilities aren't available. Nonetheless, uh, I don't know that any country was much better prepared than Australia, and I, I do think that between them, our health experts and our political leaders, including in particular the initiative by the Prime Minister to set up the National Cabinet, have served us surprisingly well. There have been some human errors, some more forgivable perhaps uh, uh, than, than others, uh, but, uh, you know, there are many... Uh, there, there, well, put it this way, if we have to be anywhere in a crisis like this... I'd rather be in Australia. OK, but does the Bernie situation show us how quickly uh, it can become a problem that's unmanageable for a small community? And there are so many of these small communities right across Australia. Well, there's always a danger of becoming unmanageable, but that's the whole point of doing everything we can, or governments and health authorities doing everything they can, to flatten the curve, to try and make certain that we don't overrun beds. Now, I mean, what is happening in Tasmania is plainly concerning. I'd hate to see it happen in any region. I'd hate to see it happen anywhere. Uh, but we have to be realistic. There is, with what we know at the moment, the very... The inevitability that there will be some nasty surprises and shocks. We have to manage them as best they ca we can and as stoically and as bravely as we can. Quickly, All right, our next question tonight comes ahead. from Yanni Leong in Blackburn, Victoria. We're being told that the stimulus packages will introduce multi-generational debt. Australians quite rightly shut down the economy to protect those most vulnerable to COVID-19. But when it comes time to foot the bill, 
Will that burden be shared across all generations? Will the government finally embark on tax reforms to curb the very generous concessions around superannuation, negative gearing and corporate tax, even if it loses them votes? Craig Foster, there's mm. going to be some very big economic decisions that have to be made mm. long after this. Mm. Yes, that's right. Um, look, I'm not an e economic expert by any measure, but what I would say is... On the other side, some of the themes that have come out here I think that are important are equality and sharing the load. Uh, and the second one is community. And those principles have to underpin what is going on now. Uh, so this sense of community, people are starting to question is, you know, what is the fabric of our society and what is it that we've prioritised? Um, and the economy is important and so too are people's lives. And I think what what for me has been really positive to see in the last month or so is that we started out with this national discussion around jobs and economy almost exclusively and because of the severity of this virus uh, many civil society organisations and others started screaming around you know the potential fallout to lives and and uh, particularly the elderly and others and that forced uh, uh, the country and I think the government into a position where they had to start to consider sectors of society that ha have been left behind in recent decades. That has been a really positive aspect of what's been going on here. And I think there's some good writing uh, coming out now. There's some good mm. debate, some good discussion about what does this country look like on the other side mm -hmm. of this, both economically mm. and in terms of community. And just on what Matt was saying before, I, I, I agree. When, you, yeah. when you're talking about community, my point around this is that you have to... I, what I'd ask for Australians is to reach out to people that you haven't done otherwise. Mm. So, in other words, there's huge cohorts of people who have been invisible in this country and who have been doing it tough for many decades, but we haven't considered them because we've had other priorities. If you can, at the moment, look outside of your immediate social... A circle, which is family and friends, and that's important, of course, to help them, but also look at the others as well. And if you can reach out two, three, four, five people, organisations elsewhere and start to get a better understanding of some of the inequalities in the country, perhaps when we come to this economic discussion, which is just happening now, we're talking now about exit strategies. What does this country look like? Mm. I would say let's yeah. make sure on an economic and yeah. all levels yeah. that it is more equal. I, th I think that is so critical because I think that we are more than just the economy. We are human beings living in society and, and Hamish as we talked about you know at the end of the bushfires the big lesson we learned out of the bushfires was when the chips were down we relied on each other we relied mm. upon that connectedness we called upon ourselves to build that and I think you've got such a great point that actually we actually have a moment where we can stop we can pause and we can say what are the values we want to take forward Indeed. that will lead us out of this. So, John like Anderson, can we do that? Can Australia <laughs> get over all of our usual divisions? Can we find a way forward that enables us to pay off this huge debt that we've suddenly landed ourselves with? It's a very, very important and critical question. And, of course, Australians are very worried about it, and rightly so. I think I'd make the point, firstly, that disunity is death. But let's frame this up for a moment. You've gone to the heart of it, I think, Hamish. Um, we will have to pull together in a way that we haven't before. We will not get the good policy that we need to extract ourselves from this mess without a high-quality debate. Mm -hmm. And a high-quality debate means that we're going to have to be respectful of one another, mm -hmm. we're going to have to stop the sneering that's evidenced in too much of the debate in recent times, the division, mm -hmm. what Jonathan Haidt calls this idea that you can divide the world into good people and bad people. Mm -hmm. We're all Australians right. together and we are going to have to learn to give everyone their say. Uh, the second point is this. Whilst people are saying ideology's dead, look at this, Conservative government's throwing money out, commanding the economy, interfering in our lives, surveillance and what have you, the reality is that uh, you can say ide ideology's dead, but to pick up on the point that uh, the two previous speakers made, uh, we need to have, think about our values. We've got to think about principles. We have to have a vigorous debate about what we look like in the end. I would start with the, the rule of law. The king must respect the peasant, the peasant must respect the king. We've got to respect our fellow Australians and let them participate properly in deciding what we look like at the end of this because it'll be very very different indeed. The, the third John, John area Anderson. that I think is worth focusing on... Uh, hang on, if I could just finish. ..is the question of um, uh, privacy 
and freedom versus surveillance and control. That will be huge. And the other area is how, in an age when we'll, there'll be limitations now on how people are prepared to embrace globalisation, but we have to ensure we have a mature debate about how nations move forward together because of the nature of our supply chains, for example, in agriculture. Uh, you know, we're interdependent. We can't live as islands, as individuals or as nations. So uh, you probably laid out an agenda for about three terms of government <laughs> so. in that one answer, John Anderson. But could I just bring you back to the, to the question about intergenerational responsibility for the debt? Yep. Because that question raised yep. uh, generous concessions around superannuation, yep. negative gearing, corporate tax. Mm. These sorts of things have been political poison for some parties, even in, in recent elections. Do we now need to be talking yep. more seriously about franking credits, negative gearing, super taxation? Uh, we'll have to have a very, very wide discussion indeed, but I'd suggest, Hamish, that those are, in fact, <laughs> if you like, the sort of measures that have to be equated against what will grow the economy. We will have to grow the economy. We are in a good position today because of previous governments of both political stripes, if you like, if I can put it that way, who had the courage to tackle things like poor productivity, uh, high debt levels and inefficient tax systems in this country. We went into the GFC with no national debt. Even today, we've been, we started at a point about 20% of debt to GDP versus most European and American countries at 80, 90, 100%. Out of this, we will have a high debt load. It will have to be dealt with. We will have to look at the taxation system. And yes, we will have to do it with equity in mind. That is a critical uh, aspect of all of this because to go back to my point about how we debate in this country, if you were, it's changed now because people are realising we, we've got to live cooperatively with one another. That's a silver lining to this cloud. I think there's a great recognition of that. But if you'd listened to the public debate before in much of the media and on uh, social media in particular, you would have thought that we were hopelessly divided. We're, we had, you know, we were terrible sexists, we were terrible racists, there was terrible inequality. We are going to have to make sure that coming out of this, every one of us who's in a position to contribute, and I think that's the great bulk of us, will have to do what we can in the interest of our country going forward, and that means our young people. There will be real issues of intergenerational equity to be tackled. All right. Our next question tonight comes from Brendan Tam in Kiala, Victoria. In the wake of COVID-19, it beca has become ever apparent that we rely upon international globalised supply chain networks for our material and economic well-being. My question for the panel is that, instead of retreating to protectionist policies of our past and becoming more insular to, in order to reduce our reliance upon imports, how do we also recognise that the international globalised community and economy remains more interconnected than ever and how do we continue to leverage our advantages, especially in food and agricultural manufacturing, in such an economic climate that is becoming more protectionist and insular globally? Uh, Matt Preston, I want to turn this over to you. Is, is food something that Australia can fall back on? Uh, is what we grow something that we can actually build our way out of this with? Well, well it, it's, it's, it's obviously something that we do really well. I, I think in terms... I think there are, there are a number of uh, factors to unpack that. Um, obviously, yes, the, you know, this idea of Australia being this, this clean environment we can grow produce that the world will want is fantastic, but we also have to support all those, you know, so many of the, the small producers who are hit by bushfires um, have really, are, still, are still waiting. They're still waiting for the insurance payments. They're still waiting for stuff to come, come through. They've, they've, been, they've been kind of forgotten about. So if we're going to be serious about, about building and maintaining this role of Australia as a, a kind of a, 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 a tourism destination, a Place with a strong hospitality um, offering that not only employs people but also provides a, a real lure for tourists to and, um, high yield tourists to come from overseas. Then, then we have to take that that very seriously. And I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we are. Um, and I, I think it's kind of it's some, it, it's, there's some stuff that's going which is fantastic. We just need to be doing more. And one of the, the issues is going to be, you know, we've lost you know all the restaurants, all the cafes, and for all the all the people doing takeaway and um, and setting up their their restaurant as a, as a little. Kind of a neighbourhood shop, this is going to do nothing when it comes back to us trying to rebuild a hospitality sector that will be absolutely decimated. 
John Anderson, the, that question obviously referred to, to protectionism. There is clearly a, a big conversation already being had in Australia about uh, we need to make more, we need to manufacture more. How does the government just turn around and do that? Do you force that to happen? It can't. It can't. There'll be some very difficult debates here. But it's a really important question. We've got to avoid excesses. You know, if we go un, un, unfettered sort of globalisation without a, an eye to the national interest in our supply chains, that would be one mistake. The people are not going to wear it. There's a rise in nationalism. We're looking to our own governments to, if you like, cluster us together as families again. On the other hand, uh, to abandon international cooperation and common sense will invite poverty and worse uh, for many more people. Let me make two really important points. Australian farmers are... No one's more efficient in this very harsh environment. We know a lot about it. Uh, but we are part of a global supply chain. Uh, we can feed people, and I think we do it very well. I'd like, at least I'd like to believe we do. Uh, but we are dependent on imported product. We can't turn a wheel uh, without oil. Uh, so one of the debates here needs to be, do we really have the reserves we need in this country if something goes wrong for an extended period of time? Um, but isn't the answer but we to need that imported that we don't, uh, chemicals we don't, from we, China? Isn't the answer to that that we don't actually have adequate oil reserves? Well, I don't believe we do. I think the government needs, has been active on it, but it needs to do more. Uh, back at the time of the 2011 floods, that's a while ago, in Queensland, right smack in the middle of our national grain harvest, the east coast of Australia went within two or three days of running out of diesel. You can't turn a wheel in agriculture, or for that matter, you know, an ambulance wheel or somebody delivering pharmaceuticals to Burke or whatever it happens to be, without adequate supplies of liquid fuel. We have around 20 days. I don't think that is enough. Onshore. So I do think the government needs to be active on that one. We've seen the price you pay when something unexpected hits. It could happen. But there's another thing I want to make that's really important here in terms of global cooperation. We don't hear much about it, but Australian expertise in agriculture, agricultural science and extension is second to none. We punch way above our weight through ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. We participate in the sort of loose groupings of people known as CGR globally. Uh, and here's the big thing. It's the one area where we're amongst the big seven. Uh, it's America, it's Australia, it's a couple of other countries and it's Bill Gates. And Bill Gates makes the point that that international agricultural extension work, the best science and so forth is the best way to lift people out of poverty. It's also a great way for us to make sure we've got scientists and experts out in the field as part of our international aid and cooperation, monitoring what happens in the area of biosecurity, plant health, uh, environmental uh, health, because that's critical to human health. A classic example, uh, African uh, swine flu, it's decimated uh, half of the Chinese uh, pig uh, herd. It's now as close uh, to us as East Timor and Papua New Guinea. We need to be involved in those debates. We need to have our best people, and they're very, very good, involved at the front line. It's one of the most effective things we can do in helping internationally. Our next question tonight comes from Michael Melanagi in Frankston South, Victoria. My question to the panel is during this period of quarantine, how can we use this opportunity to envisage a better, more compassionate and sustainable future? Well, it's clear a lot of you are thinking about this topic because so many of you are rushing back into the garden and into the kitchen as well. So before I put that question to the panel, uh, I've put this one to someone that has been doing it for decades. Costa, there's clearly something instinctive in us that's leading people to go and buy seeds at the moment, to buy chooks so they've got eggs. Do you see that as a positive thing? I think it's a really positive thing if it's cradled and supported in the right way. People have realised that the supply chains, our food security, when that supply chain was threatened, people realised, hang on a sec, I'm not secure. So this was really confronting. People are coming forward, they're saying, how can I grow something? How do I look after chickens? How can I um, make sourdough? How can I preserve and pickle and make sauerkraut and get my inner composting system working? How can I do these things? For me, the most important thing we need to do is support these people as they go down this journey, because it's not panic. I want to change the P with an M, and I want to see people manic about growing. <laughs> when I spoke to you the other day, you said that this is the stuff you've been thinking about and talking about for 20 years. What did you mean? A lot of it's been 
parallel universe. And it's like, yeah, yeah, Costa, you look at you, you're bearded, hippie, kind of living in the 70s, doing your thing. But these are really old school, simple, practical methods and skills that families passed on. These are our granny skills and our grandpa skills. And when I think about the fact that we've got this isolation between the grandparents and the children, I really see this as a, a, a re-establishment of this connection and a revaluing of it and saying, hey, our elders are the most important and our kids are the most important. We need to bring them together. And this time where we can reconnect with our family, and even if it's virtual, to me, that's where the strength is. And I think when we build on that, we'll build a different future. We'll have our families together. Do you understand, though, Costa, why a lot of people are actually quite scared right now? Yeah, look, I, I'm not living in a bubble, but I'm saying in something like the garden, there's this context of horticultural therapy. You can come out and take your mind off it. You can come out and start to grow something. All of these plants volunteered here. I can live off these for weeks by making different meals out of it. And if we start to do that and we take the panic out and say, well, I'm going to start to grow some things that I can use to supplement my food, which means I won't have to spend as much money because I don't have that money coming in at the moment. People are creative. And, you know, you saw it in the fires. You saw it, you saw it in, the, in these times of, of challenge where that, that mongrel spirit can come out. And as long as that mongrel spirit sticks with the rules and says, OK, let's keep the distance. Let's do what we have to do. This isn't fun. And people, people aren't going to get back what they had in some cases. And that's, that's really, you know, That's, that's not good. There's this incredible timelessness that's not easy, but it's this joyful opportunity to get connected to permaculture, get connected to gardening, make time, grow time, do time in the garden. You know, it's like there's, there's you know, and just because I'm laughing, I, I don't know, I'd rather be laughing than crying. Yeah, I think there's big opportunities for us to look at this time and come out with a whole suite of new skills, regardless of where we come out and when that is. So, uh, yeah, go forth and garden, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Julie McCrossan, are you as evangelical about, notwithstanding all of the difficulties that we're facing right now, that, that there might be for some people opportunity here to, to reimagine their future? Look, to be honest with you, I am more, as I sit in rural New South Wales, uh, in a town where there are two prisons and with towns on either side of me that also have prisons that play an important role in the economy, I'm concerned as we're discussing the future and our values as a society about the voices we're not hearing. And among those voices we're not hearing are the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And 100 years ago, when the Spanish flu hit us, which is our most recent similar pandemic experience, the people who had the highest proportion of deaths were Aboriginal people. And we've talked about our wonderful food production, but in remote communities uh, for Aboriginal people, we still can't provide uh, fresh food at, at a, a price people can afford. Uh, so I want to hear the voices standing beside our Prime Ministers and our, our State Premiers. I want to hear the Indigenous doctors, the Indigenous nurses uh, who are dealing with the crises in both uh, uh, rural and also urban Aboriginal communities. Uh, and I also want to hear what are we doing with those cruise liners which are prisons that don't sail anywhere, that, again, there's plenty of international evidence are places where COVID-19 will spread. And we're not giving a voice to the Aboriginal community and the kids in, in, in detention centres and, uh, uh, you know, juvenile justice centres where the Aboriginal population are overrepresented. I'm, I'm sorry to get practical, but I go shopping 
in my uh, local community and there are prison officers there with me. This isn't just the people in the prisons that often people don't feel much empathy for. It's the staff working with them who move out into many rural communities and there, where there isn't good social distancing in my observation. And I want to hear the voices of people with disabilities who rely on carers coming into their home and whether those carers are getting this protective clothing and masks that we need. So you can see uh, I'm a bit more grassroots at the moment, Amy. Craig Foster, is mm. there a moral obligation as a society to do more than we are for those behind bars right now? Because this is a, this is a serious matter, isn't it? Particularly, as Julie pointed out, disproportionate representation of Indigenous Australians inside our prison systems. Some countries are, in fact, releasing people from behind bars. There is an argument in Australia being presented that people on shorter sentences, six months, for example, mm -hmm. should actually be released because there is a, a genuine health issue. If there is a public health issue and a, a personal safety issue for those people and there's no uh, major health or security issues for them, of course they should be released. And much of this discussion, I think, in the end comes back to something that has to also underpin where we go after this, both uh, locally, uh, nationally and internationally, is human rights. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question around what the world is going to look like is just as important as what yeah. Australia is going to look yeah. like and what is our yeah. place in the world. So, so who are we? Who are we going to give a voice to? I think what Julie's saying is absolutely right. What's happened, of course, I think I would hope the majority of Australians would recognise that the plight of our uh, Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters at the moment is an absolute national shame. And so perhaps this is an opportunity to once again recalibrate the way we're looking at the situation. So, for instance, people are now starting to say, well, and rightly, well, nurses and doctors, or well, nurses certainly, and frontline workers and health workers and bus drivers and all these people, they're the people who are saving us now. They're saving elderly Australians, they're saving all of us, they're, they're making sure that we're fed, they're making sure we're housed, making sure that we're safe. And we haven't valued many of those professions in the way that we should. Social work and human rights areas, an area where I've spent considerable time in recent years, and I've said many times that the people there, fabulous people, they're actually working daily to save lives. And I'm talking about all of the NGOs, human rights organisations, who are who are ensuring that the minimum uh, incarceration mm. age for uh, children in Australia is trying to raise, I think in Queensland was 10, and has raised to perhaps 12 now or something. Mm. Um, these people are fighting for rights of Indigenous and others and homeless and, and refugees and asylum seekers who are also behind bars, I might say, at the moment, who also should be released into community detention, also at significant risk, both to, both to public health and also to themselves individually, and their human rights say that they should also be released. I, I want to stop you there because our next question comes from Dr Iyengaran Selvaratnam in Liverpool, New South Wales. I'm concerned for the 1,400 men, women and children who are at high risk of COVID-19 infection in our overcrowded immigration detention facilities in Australia, PNG and Nauru. Our government acknowledges this risk, yet ignores calls from thousands of health professionals like me to release these people into community detention. Furthermore, many asylum seekers on temporary protection and bridging visas are ineligible for Centrelink support and Medicare. Is it not time that we said game over when it comes to the inhumane treatment of asylum seekers by our government? John Anderson. Well, if we got, get this wrong coming out of this, can I make two points? We won't be able to afford to help anyone, needy or unneedy. We are really talking about our economic future and I'd be the first to say we ought to look after the marginalised and the disadvantaged, but we need to focus on the need to pull together and accept our responsibilities and to do what we can to rebuild and to be good international citizens. Refugees are always a problem, and I pay tribute, for example, to Craig for some of the work that he's done there. Okay. But the way this may play out globally could result in vastly more dispossessed and mm -hmm. troubled people looking for escape. We need to be active on the ground, and to do that, we have to be a well enough resourced country. I'm sorry to have to say to it, but I think we've spent a bit of time focusing on the concerns of various people in the community who we need to be cognizant of, but frankly, we're not going to be able to do anything for any of them if we don't find a way through this that ensures that we're able to recover our economic 
and social cohesion as a nation. Julie McCrossan. Could I comment? I'm a gay woman. I'm 65. I was alive when HIV AIDS began and we grappled with this pandemic. There, certain wonderful things were done in Australia and I think our nation at the moment is doing many of these things, but one thing they're not doing. So how we overcame HIV AIDS and reduced it in our country was that it became a non... It became a bipartisan issue, so the different parties came together. The, party, the political leaders came together with the medical and health sector and they also came together with the most at-risk people, which in that time was uh, homosexuals, uh, self-injecting drug users and people we called men having sex with men. These were men who didn't think of themselves as homosexual, often married with children, but they did actually have sex with men at times. And our political leaders and our health leaders engaged intimately with those groups. They overcame the stigma. And why did they do it? Because they weren't going to defeat HIV AIDS and stop it spreading into the broader community unless they engage with those groups. And that's why I'd say to John Anderson, this isn't about some, a mob over there we don't have to worry about while we look after the bulk of Australia. If we don't look after the uh, 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 most vulnerable, the, the prisoners, the kids in juvenile justice, the homeless, uh, the people with cognitive and mental health and alcohol issues that have made them brain damaged so they're not hearing the social distancing and other messages, then we will not lower the curve so low that we can eliminate this. So, so, we have so, to care about these people. So we can see the complexity. I'm not advocating that we don't care about them. I'm just yeah. saying that it requires a resourceful, including in economic terms, society to be able to meet those needs. If you doubt it, look at the struggles that are going on in poorer countries. Uh, Craig Countries Foster. that can't get their act together politically. Mm -hmm. You can see the complexity of the of argument course. here. Of course. Yeah. So what's the answer? What do you do now mm -hmm. with these individuals that are clearly at risk? Well, the asylum seekers and refugees who are in the alternative uh, places of detention should be released in the community immediately. I mean, all of the medical community, or vast majority of them, are calling for that to happen now. In a pandemic, you know, that most of us, you know, it's the first time uh, in our lifetime we've seen this. The, the best decisions that have happened from government level have been guided by medical and health professionals. And they're saying that these APODs in particular and the detention centres are, are potential hotspots for COVID-19. I've been to the Mantra in Melbourne uh, and I've seen the conditions there and it's patently not safe for these people. So my question to Australia is, how is it that we make an exception for some of these groups of society? And so if this is about all being together now, and it certainly must be, and building community and building social cohesion is a wonderful term, uh, but then no one can miss out. And Julie's talking about Indigenous, so there's many, many parts of society who have been missing out. And the way that we've demonised and treated asylum seekers and refugees in the last decade is horrendous. It's been deeply politicised and uh, Australia has, has turned ourselves in, in, in contortions in order to not just you know, provide these people, human beings, with their basic human rights, and, and that is they have a right to seek asylum. So these people, many of them have been medically evacuated to Australia, so underlying chronic health conditions and compromised immune systems are two of the main uh, risk factors for COVID-19. That's exactly what these people have. So in, in an alternate world where people, you know, where Australia hasn't been through the last decade where we've put these people in a horrible position, they would be out already. They'd be out like that. Of course they would. Most Australians would very quickly say, of course you need to put these people in community detention. But let's not only talk about people onshore. We've got also this cohort, I think it's around still 400 offshore as well. There's about 220 in Port Moresby. I went there last October. I saw the conditions they're in. I saw how heavily medical they are. I saw the mental health severe issues after seven years of deprivation of freedom that they've had. Now, you know, we go back to 2013 when Australia had a, had a, a problem in, in terms of uh, immigration and, and found a solution. That solution has proven to be trading one set of lives for another and for the well-being and health of these human beings. 
So it surely must be time that as a country we say, come on guys, we are part of the international community here and this pandemic, along with I think climate change as well as the big two global issues, which are teaching to Australians and to the rest of the world that we are intimately connected. And these major global issues are, are, are I think starting to at least get Australians to, to look at uh, you know, our position in the world and we can't breach the rights of these people and then go preaching to China around their human rights, in, in, whether it's with this pandemic or, or otherwise. We have to have a, a basic benchmark, a, a low, a threshold, a basic threshold beneath which we will not descend. Mm. And we have descended in relation to these asylum seekers and refugees, and we should put it right, guys. Our next question tonight comes from David Guo in Oatley, New South Wales. Despite there being no competition or matches at the moment, what role do you think sporting authorities like soccer, the NRL, the AFL can play in helping people's mental health and breaking down social isolation during this lockdown period? Uh, Matt Preston, I, I'm interested to hear your take <laughs> on the way some of the sporting codes are, are dealing with this situation. Oh, oh, it's, it's, an, it's an empty life without... I'm, I'm starting to look at the Belarusian um, soccer results at the moment because I'm, I'm kind of missing out. I'm missing out what's going on. I can't, I can't believe the ABC aren't showing the Belarusian um, league at the moment. Um, it, it, it is amazing when you realise how much, how much of your time you spend um, uh, obsessing about sport, talking about sport. Um, in, terms, in terms of, obviously, you've got to keep, you've got to keep the, the players safe, you've got to keep the fans safe, but... Um, um, you also we we need bread and circuses at a time like this, and I, you know, whether whether it's a plan with a with a with a lockdown limited number of teams at the AIS, or I, I think there's a I think there's definitely a need for us to have something to talk about other than just the virus, because this this endless discussion about this is bad, this is terrible. I, I'm, I'm sure Christine would have a view on this. The, it's the endless obsession about about the bad things and not enough discussion about the good stuff that that, yeah. that has a huge impact on a huge number of people. Christine, oh, is, look, it, Matt, is it that important? Look, I, I think he's absolutely spot on, Matt. I think that's absolutely right. That that look, they are anxious times, they're uncertain times, but there are good things. I think one of the other things with sport, it's part of the Aussie psyche. It's part of being able to say we are moving forward. We will come through this. We will come through this, and there are some things that we will take forward with us. And I can't imagine us giving up our sport. So I think it is a, an affirmation, if you like, that circumstances have changed. But if we can do something safely, let's take it forward. Craig Foster, what do you make then of some leading sporting administrative figures first asking the government for money and then seeming to push their way towards a competition mm. being played out when there's clearly medical advice, the doubts whether that's possible, mm. political leaders in some states are saying not on. What do you make of it? Well, I don't think anyone is surprised in sport because, um, you know, it, it likes to think that it sits uh, as an exception to society in many ways. But as, does it? Does it? No, it doesn't. No. And that, that is true uh, throughout history when sport has uh, gone through a whole heap of uh, labour issues and... and, uh, and uh, with all of their professional athletes and many, many instances through history. And now it was, I think, a normal that sport would say, well, we should keep playing during this time, even though, you know, everyone else kind of has to shut down because it's really important for people oh, to watch us, yeah. rather than saying, well, listen, our role... At the, what is our role in society? So, so, what so is our responsibility? So is the rugby league's, uh, Peter Van is doing a good community service here by saying we're going <laughs> to put this competition on come what may? Or... Is it the wrong thing? Does it send the wrong message to the community, having sporting players travelling, yeah. maybe taking up some of the PPE uh, masks mm. that uh, there's not enough of at the moment? Um, I think sport was slow to stop and that was a poor message. Sport's responsibility is to lead socially in many ways and, in my view, the best response would have been from sport is what does the country need from us? What does society need from us? And then, but the, of course, the financial pressures that sport has is one reason why they're doing what they're doing. So the, also, sport will come out of this with a kind of reassessment 
of the whole financial structure and the reliance on the broadcast deals and so on. And that's, let's face it, that's why NRL are doing so. They've done it in a way, though, that is, I think, typical of sport. That is that, you know, we can go and do our own thing over here. Uh, and both the medical officers are, I think, uh, New South Wales and Queensland, so we haven't been consulted on this. And not only is it a poor look, but it just, I think, um, misunderstands the role of sport in society. What would be wonderful for Vlandis and others at NRL and every sport is to go to the government and say, what is it that you need from us now? Because don't forget, the people who watch sport and love sport, many of them are the younger generation. And so they're influenced by sport. Sport enjoys that. Sport sells sponsorships for that through the influence that we have on society. Well, your influence in a pandemic can be as negative as, you know, as some of the positives that Matt and Christine were talking about. So go to the government now, make sure that you're working with them and everyone understands that you want to start as soon as safe and, and practicable. Mm. That's fine, but just do it so that you're telling all of your fans, which if, if you congregate all of sport, I mean, a football, our game, is two million participants, but I think it's around five million Australians who follow the game. You've got AFL is massive, rugby league and others. If sport is to have a, the, a positive social message now, um, you have a campaign around some of your high-profile players doing the right thing, which I think you know perhaps should have been out already. I would have loved to see something like that. And now manages itself and its public message in a way that um, you know promotes uh, the correct medical messages to the Australian public. In my view, that's the responsibility of sport now. And I might say, because we're closed down, is also to help vulnerable communities, those communities who have underpinned sport for you know over 100 years, and that is to get out in the community and actually help people who need our support now. Across Australia, you're watching Q&A this Easter Monday. Well, there's still a lot more to come on the program tonight. We're going to catch up with the Wiggles later. We're also going to discuss uh, what the current restrictions mean for our personal freedoms and whether we might get those back uh, after this is over. But our next question tonight comes from Jodie Sinclair in Fern Tree Gully, Victoria. I'm a single mum that's a relieving shift worker with two children. My son, Rex, is in Year 12 this year and I'm worried because they're about to start online learning. When he goes to school, his teachers can motivate and encourage him to do well in his studies. My question to the panel is, how am I going to motivate and encourage Rex to do well in his studies this year? All right, well, thanks very much to Rex. We're going to put this question tonight to Gabby Stroud, who's an author and former teacher. She's on the south coast of New South Wales in Marimbula tonight. Uh, this is a question, Gabby, that I think many Australian parents are asking right now. Yes, how do you motivate students? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And um, it's a question that teachers face every single day. It's not an easy task to keep kids on task. It's not easy to keep them motivated. It's not easy to keep them engaged in learning. And I would like to welcome parents to the world of education. It is a big challenge. Um, on a practical level, you know, how do we um, engage and motivate our students during this difficult time and this challenging time when they're learning from home? I think that if you were to look to your school for some hints and tips, they could um, certainly help you out and they could certainly provide you with some direction. I'm sure that the teachers who know that student would also be um, willing to provide that um, direct encouragement, um, perhaps through email or the messaging that's been set up through that school, that online learning platform. I really think, though, what we need to... Gabby, there's an added complication here, though, and we have had some questions about this. Christy Hewell's written in talking about the fact that on top of the homeschooling, she's working from home full-time. Uh, the son is in Grade 3. Mm -hmm. How do you actually balance uh, delivering the homeschooling with also doing your own job in the same space at the same time? Mm, it's really tricky. The first thing I'd just like to clarify too is that we're not actually, the situation we find ourselves in right now isn't actually homeschooling. What we're seeing right now are students learning from home, just like adults are working from home. So no one's actually expecting parents to teach their child as a teacher would in a classroom. Teachers are working very, very hard to deliver curriculum 
online and remotely in many varied forms so that their students can still access it. But I totally understand as a parent at home with my girls at the moment, the challenge that this poses when we're trying to get our own work done as well. And I think that what we need to start doing, and it's an idea that the panel um, has kept um, circling around all night, we keep asking what works, what's going to work, what's going to get us through this, what works. But I really think we need to shift to a different question and it needs to be what matters. We need to ask ourselves what really matters right now because I'm here to tell you a little secret that teachers want all parents to know. We know mistakes are going to be made. We know kids are going to miss out on essential um, learning that should have been covered this year. We know that there's going to be a disruption to learning. We just can't do it all, no matter how hard teachers work um, and with what integrity parents go at this learning from home at, with their own children. So we need to shift and we need to stop asking what's going to work, what's going to get us through, what's going to get my kid from A to B. And we need to start asking what matters, what matters right now. And what matters right now is that our families feel harmonious and safe. Children can't learn unless they feel safe and there's high anxiety in the air around them all the time at the moment, especially, you know, as related to this pandemic that we face. So we need to really adjust our expectations and what we're asking of ourselves and what we're asking of our children at this time. We have other languages of value rather than um, the grades that we achieve and the amount of online lessons that we get through. I really think that if teachers could talk to parents right now, frankly and candidly, without being gagged, as teachers so often are, they would really like parents just to relax, take a breath. We know that you're doing the best that you can. Look for opportunities around the home where you can educate your child and just be with them at this time. Help them get through this. What our kids are actually learning right now is how we deal with a crisis. That's what they're learning and this is a massive life skill and this is what matters at this point in time. Uh, one question that came in from Megan Green, uh, Gabby, is the scrapping of NAPLAN a good thing? Should it stay that way? What's your view? Look, if there's anything good to come out of this pandemic, it's the scrapping of NAPLAN. That gets a huge smile from me. Um, and isn't that an interesting concept? Because just three or four months ago, if we had have suggested scrapping NAPLAN, it would be like someone was saying, let's remove the Sydney Harbour Bridge and we'd all be in, up in arms and we wouldn't be able to imagine our world without it. And yet, just like that, it can be gone. And that's what I'm thinking about and talking about here in this idea of rather than focusing on what works, it's about what matters matters. What matters right now is reducing the stress that we're feeling in our homes and in our families. And I'm really hoping that when we look at our education system post-pandemic, we find ourselves in a world where NAPLAN is just a distant memory. OK, well, our next two questions tonight, Gabby, come from Suniha and Dale, both with their kids. My seven-month-old has been indoors for most of his life, initially due to the poor air quality caused by the bushfires and now the COVID-19 virus. Keeping things interesting for their rapidly developing minds is hard to do, particularly with urban living. Care to share your wisdom in keeping our little ones busy? Hi, this is my 18-month-old daughter, Frankie. And one thing that my wife and I are particularly worried about, with all the physical distancing measures in place, is that she's now staying home with us full-time. If she's not able to interact with other children and adults in person for a sustained period of time, what impact will this have on her and other children's social development? Say bye. You wait. Good girl. <laughs> Gabby Stroud, I mean, is, is there a simple answer here? There's not a simple answer and what I would um, suggest is that um, in that whole um, response I keep giving about what, what matters is what matters in your family and what will um, bring your family through this is going to be uniquely different from what is happening to the family for the family next door. We can be certain that this um, pandemic is going to have deep, long-lasting impact on, on our children, on our little ones. You know, they will remember this. This will be, uh, you know, engraved in their in their memory and their psyche because it's, it's greatly impacting on their ability to socialise and, you know, in them not being able to attend 
daycare and school settings. You know, we're reducing their world. We're really shrinking it. In terms of how we combat that and how we deal with that in our homes and at this time, I think we need to get really, really creative. We need to be really okay with our homes being really messy. I know that's something that's happening in my house. I think we have to really look at creative ways of connecting with the family members that we can't be with. And we need to really support our kids in understanding what's going on. We need to nurture them through these uncertain feelings that they're having. And that'll happen through really really um, candid and loving conversations that we have as a family. All right, Gabby Strad, thank you very much for that. We have had lots of questions about how particularly small children can handle this particular crisis and we thought, who does Australia really trust? Who does Australia really love when it comes to some of these tough questions? Uh, we couldn't think of anyone better than the Wiggles. We asked them if they'd be happy to join this conversation tonight. We're surprised to say that they agreed. I spoke to them earlier. G'day, nice to see you, Hamish. Uh, Emma, I'm interested to know, at a time like this, it brings the value of your work into, into a very different perspective. Had you ever imagined a time when, when families would be so reliant on the work that you guys do? I guess as the Wiggles, we have a responsibility and we are responsible for educating and entertaining children um, to the best ability that we can. And I guess we felt like it was really important for us to react to this coronavirus situation as quickly as possible and to provide children and families with a video um, and actions and a song that children could join in and understand this abstract concept of social distancing. And do you think much about what the long-term impact of all of this going on will be on your audience, the children, because obviously we're all going to come out of this somehow different. I think um, children today who grow up, uh, there, there could be a sense of fear of the outside world uh, because the coronavirus is again like the bogeyman. So yes, I think there'll be an effect on children. It's quite a challenging time for parents, for teachers and for young children to, do, to uh, get their head around it because even as adults, it's hard to understand how this has happened and why it's happening. So are you surprised at the way children are taking on and shouldering responsibility here? We're trying to uh, encourage the parents to uh, give the children a, a positive way of dealing with the uh, coronavirus, empowering them, washing your hands. If you wash your hands so many times, you'll be safe. It'll keep yourself safe from the coronavirus. Or if, if we stay home and don't visit grandma, that'll keep her safe and uh, you're doing such a good thing. So I guess we're, we've got to try and empower children and make them feel uh, like they have some sort of power over this coronavirus. Well, we've obviously done a lot of surprising things on Q&A this year. This is probably one of the more surprising. Uh, we're going to see this song you guys have written to help educate kids and presumably all of us as well uh, about social distancing. So take it away. Great. Here we go. Social okay, distancing. Practice social distancing. Practice, practicing, practicing. <laughs> okay, I was going up the back. <laughs> okay, Lucky, go for it. One, two, three, four. Oh, why can't I go to Nana's place? We're staying at home to keep Nana safe. What can we do to make her feel better? Let's video call her or write a letter. That will make her all for better so. Wash our hands. Well, it helps to keep the germs away. Let's wash our hands many times a day. When you wash the germs to zero, you become a hand washing hero. So My friend called Marty. We'll stay at home, have a video party. So we can see our friends at home. Sing and dance and have some fun. We are never on our own. So show distancing. Staying home to help the world. So show distancing.
Thank you very much, guys. I can't believe it, Matt. It was Matt Preston, how are you going to get to sleep with that in your head tonight? Oh, Bob, it's not quite hot potato, but it's there. It's close enough. <laughs> it, it is a very serious point, though, Christine Morgan. There, there's a very young generation that is obviously having to interpret this whole experience for yeah. itself and for adults is difficult. Is it more difficult for a child? Look, I think it's just on a different level. I think we were just saying this, that um, every single one of us, I think that's come out really clearly tonight as we talk about all the different people in society, all different groups. The thing that is different about this particular coronavirus is that none of us, none of us are immune from it. So each and every person is affected and everybody comes into it as an individual. So I think actually it's about, with little people, it's two things. I think it's understanding where they're coming from, having the chance to actually ask them a question and, and really engage and answer those questions. And then let's not lose the concept of fun. Let's not lose the concept of being able to say, we don't have to be totally controlled by our environments. How can we as adults help them actually do good and fun things? Like the Wiggles have just done, but I think that's a really underpinning important message there is we can actually do things that are positive at the moment. It's not all negative and unsafe. Okay, our next question tonight is from Sharon Deckers in Rockhampton, Queensland. In Australia, over one in seven people are aged 65 and over. This is a significant and growing population group. My mum is a member of this group and has just come out of hospital. What can we do as a nation and as a family unit to ensure that the elderly who live in their own homes are not only protected but also supported mentally, physically, spiritually and financially during this pandemic? Craig Foster, how much time are you spending volunteering at the moment? A lot, yeah. And uh, one reason is because the uh, volunteer workforce in the country is very largely, for many organisations, elderly over the age of 60. And, of course, self they have to self-isolate and so it's been decimated. So, so, so the, the volunteer workforce essentially yes. has been wiped out to a large extent? For many organisations. Some, for instance, the New South Wales Cancer Council need, f need 40 drivers or slightly less now. I think we might have find a found a couple in the last week. Uh, and that is because elderly drivers cannot get cancer patients to hospital to continue their treatment right now. So we're working for sport to step up. You know, we've talked about sport before. You know, sport is a high profile industry. It's a business and there's a lot of fallout in sport as there is across so many sectors of Australian society. But it also is, is essence of community fabric as well. And all of these community clubs around the country have a huge role to play right now in stepping mm -hmm. forward this concept of team. You know, uh, for instance, our Waverley Old Boys here in Sydney, by volunteering, there's around 60 of us in that club alone volunteering for registered charities through, you know, all the COVID safety guidelines, of course, essential services we're talking about. And that volunteering may be online or off, that is uh, digital services or, or telehealth or calling elderly people, whatever the case is, or physical as I'm doing. Um, and that actually also brings that team closer together at this period of time. And it actually creates or, or maintains that social yeah. connection yeah. and it allows sport to reach out to sectors of society that they're not familiar with. And that's one of the really positive things I'm hoping that will come out of this is that through sport, which is a huge, vast, connecting social network, we can use that to, to create more nodes of connection. And, and, uh, and by bringing sport closer to this kind of volunteering social services sector as well, perhaps we can get sport to we start to, to consider a li yeah. little bit more of humanity. And, and we need these new ways, don't we? Like, just as it's affecting each and every Australian, we actually have to find unique ways. Yeah. There's no cookie cutter for this. No. Isn't there just a, a very practical, way. physical challenge with looking after people that are in those older at-risk categories because we're yeah. told, actually, you've got to stay away, mm. uh, so but at the same time, they're extremely vulnerable. So the, the mm. real challenge here, the real challenge, I think, is, yes, we accept the fact that it's difficult, but let's find the ways. So let's find those ways where we can reach in. So we have the online, we have the digital, we have phones, we have ways to connect with them. We do know that a lot of the NGOs and charities are finding the community, community volunteer visiting scheme mm -hmm. is finding new ways to reach into people. The key thing, Hamish, is that we don't forget anybody and we, we really think creatively, as you're saying, how do we create those networks to reach in mm. and find people? Because it is critical at any age that they receive the support mm. they need. Uh, Julie McCross, and I can see you Hamish, trying to get in. 
I am because I think the key to uh, older people, I'm 65 myself, many of my friends are in their 70s, the key for older people accessing the full range of opportunities during this probably extended period of home isolation and for children, whether they be preschool or school, is the digital world. And we do not have equal access in Australia mm -hmm. either to the technology. Uh, there are many children who don't have computers. There are two and a half million families that do not have access to the internet. And in rural and remote Australia, there's varied reliability on access to broadband. And so it, there is a, a practical both skill and uh, technology side to this that has to be dealt with during this period. Uh, and uh, I, I think there is a real divide too but in many of the school sectors between schools that have a pre-existing level of skill in terms of developing and presenting lessons to students online and, of course, the... Uh, the uh, um, uh, you know, the distance education, help me, John Anderson, that uh, there are very skilled people who've been doing distance education to rural and remote Australia for years, but many of our contemporary teachers do not have those skills. And many public teachers at the moment are scrambling to get basic digital skills and lesson planning. One other quick thing I want to say for both children and elderly people, but let's focus on young children. School isn't just education. Education matters. But teachers are about relationships, particularly for vulnerable children. And children have to have access to computers to reach through that screen to the teachers that know and love them and understand their family vulnerabilities. So we need to help all kids to get access uh, via computers to their teachers. Okay. Yeah. Well, our next question tonight is from David Foster in Tamworth, New South Wales. Our governments, federal and state, are making rules on the run. Draconian laws are being enacted and enforced during COVID-19, and we're accepting them, even applauding them. And while this is acceptable in these drastic times, I want to ask the panel if they believe that all of these laws will be expunged when it's all over, or is there a danger that legislation such as travel restrictions remain in place, just in case? And Will Big Brother be watching more intensively and intrusively than ever before? Will we become the new China? Matt Preston, I, I think we've all found ourselves complying mm. with things we would never have imagined yeah. ourselves complying with probably just months ago. It's amazing. It's amazing how, how for the vast majority of Australians we've um, we've we've willingly adopted um, a total surrender of, of things that were, a month ago we took as being kind of essential rights. Um, yes, it, it's 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 very worrying. And, and anyone who's read enough dystopian novels will know that this is exactly the the potential thin end of the wedge. But then I think we also have to acknowledge that we have a that so long as we have a, an engaged um, media and we have engaged community questions of what's happening, hopefully, and we have power through, you know, social media and, and what Julie, Julie has been talking about, as long as we're, we're empowered to do that and as long as people continue to listen, then I think, then I think we can, we're probably OK. But, but I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a really, it's an absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's two steps away from Gilead. Yeah, are you surprised, Craig Foster, for what we've all just agreed to do and not really questioned? Um, yes and no, because as the virus grew, I think the chaos uh, and the uh, nerves and, if you like, fear started mm -hmm. to grow in the community and become a cacophony. And in the end, um, I, I thought actually, uh, particularly Daniel Andrews and Gladys in New South Wales, uh, did a good job by stepping forward and, uh, you know, increasing the level of... Uh, um, you know the state of emergency in Victoria and others, and um, and the, and the government response. However, I might say that the the question is a really excellent one, and this is where your human rights organisations, who again, uh, there's a bit of a theme here, but are one of the sectors of society who I think are very much undervalued, and who people, all of us, we get on with our lives, and we have certain priorities. And uh, many of those priorities were kind of uh, taught or, or socialised to follow and that this is the right thing. And yet these people are doing work every single day to make sure that our rights are intact. And they're, they're going to have a big role to play here. Amnesty International, but, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Law Centre, in ensuring on the other side... Does involve yeah. society pushing back a bit if yeah. something goes too far? And at the moment, we seem pretty comfortable with 
phone companies may be working with governments to track where someone that's tested positive to COVID-19 might be at any one time. Uh, the tech giants saying, oh, look, we can provide services to governments uh, that enable us to know where anyone with COVID-19 might yeah. go. I mean, you don't really hear the outcry no. from society yet. No, that's right. And, but the human rights organisations are raising the alarm, as is David, uh, David Foster. And he, uh, what he's saying is exactly right. You need to make sure that on the other side of this, uh, some of the historic inequities are overcome, but also that our underlying basic human rights and civil rights are protected. And that discussion has to happen now. And that's why you know, they're starting to already um, try to have this discussion with broader Australia. So uh, for it to be raised in this forum, I think is actually really important right now to ensure that the discussion uh, begins uh, and that we realise on the other side of this, we need to make sure that we all have our rights fully protected, uh, and that means, as, as many have said here tonight, that means everyone, OK? So it's not just about us sitting here, many of whom have, you know, have privileged positions in society, many of whom have been given gifts and things that others don't have. And let's make sure that they're part of that discussion. On the other side, everyone is going to be able to have fair opportunity. And can I just put a plug in there? And I think this is one of the importance about focusing in and recognising our mental health and our wellbeing, is that I truly believe that part of our foundational work at coming out the other side is to look after our mental health and wellbeing. If we can keep ourselves well, if we can keep ourselves robust, if we can keep ourselves contributing, mm. we can have these really complex conversations, we can build our future, but to do it we need to be well. Uh, I want to bring in John mm. Anderson. I think the line you dropped out momentarily, John, so I'm not sure if you caught the question, but it was about all of the things oh, the that, that have been done quite quickly that society seems to have accepted. Do you think those measures are here to stay or, or will they be snapped back, as the Prime Minister uses the term in reference to the economic measures? It's an unbelievably important question and it goes to the heart of what I tried to say earlier. We are going to need a, a very high quality debate involving yeah. all Australians about what sort of society, what sort of principles we're going to apply. And one of the great areas of focus will be there's battle between privacy and freedom on one hand. I, I, I'm, I think we've talked a little bit too much about rights tonight. We need to talk about responsibilities mm -hmm. and freedoms a little more. And on the other hand, uh, security uh, and surveillance. These are going to be critical issues because Big Brother has arrived. The technologies are there. They are quite extraordinary with facial technology, with biometrics, the whole bit. We could very easily find that our freedoms and our privacies are severely compromised. It's one of the issues that I think people listening to this program will be wondering about very deeply. In the short term, we've been prepared to sacrifice some freedoms for security, for good reason. In the long term, we have to go back to asking what sort of Australia do we really want to live in? Mm -hmm. And can I just say, I, I have to gently demur from some of the, the tone and the emphasis in some of the previous remarks. We need to talk about what will unite us and how we find freedom together rather than for endlessly talking about clashing human rights. I understand why we want to emphasise rights at various times, but coming out of this, we're going to have to emphasise cooperation and teamwork and responsibility and a genuine commitment of fairness, particularly between the generations. How, how do we do that, John? Because it seems as a society that we, we, we are not particularly good at doing that any longer. Mm. No, we're not. That's why I say this is a seminal moment for Western culture and for Australia. Uh, we have lost the ability to have a full-throated but respectful debate mm. and then land things in a proper place no, we're all in so, it together. So how do we the get elected, it back? How the electors back? and the journalists. So how do we get by that back? By a great exercise of willpower, by, by recognising that we are now confronted with a moment where if we get it wrong, the price will be deadly. If we get it right, we can rebuild cohesion and we can rebuild the economic strength that enables us to look after the weak, the disadvantaged, to ensure that our supply chains for medicine, for food, what have you, are intact. If we fall about dividing amongst ourselves the way we've increasingly done in recent times, well, we just kick the can down the road like we did after the GFC, globally, not just in Australia, and the next time there's a serious problem, we'll have no shots left in the armoury. This is serious.
And Matt, I think Australians know it's serious. Uh, Matt, very briefly, do you think as a country we can come together in the way John has just described to tackle I... these enormous questions? John talked about Jonathan Haidt before, and, and Haidt's very interesting on this idea of, of silencing the, the cacophony and the screaming um, that happens between the far left and the far right just shouting at each other. And in the middle, you've got this exhausted majority, and it's how do we engage the exhausting, exhausted majority. And, and I think what's been most uh, um, positive about this has been the, that you've got Labour and Liberal politicians agreeing, sitting on a national cabinet together um, and actually just deciding what the sensible course is. And I think Australians, as a group, know what the sensible course is. Obviously, in times of, of crisis like this, the most vulnerable people are going to suffer the most. And so we need to put plans in place to, to look after yeah. them. But we need to ensure that all Australians, and that includes that exhausting majority in the middle, get, a, 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 get their view held rather than listening to the, the kind of clamouring of the outrage on either side of the politics. All right. Well, on that note, that I is all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our panel uh, coming together from across the country. Matt Preston, Christine Morgan here in the studio, John Anderson, to Craig Foster and to Julie McCrossan. And to thank you at home for sharing your questions with us. Uh, we're really enjoying seeing the videos from where you are right across the country. Please join me next week. We'll ask what we need to do next now that the spread of COVID-19 does appear to be slowing. We'll be joined by some big thinkers, Neville Power, Sally McManus, Simon Longstaff, Gigi Foster and Jody McVernon. So uh, hopefully we'll make a start on that debate that we were just discussing the need for then.